Welcome back to the Illumination Lectures. In Lecture 1, we saw how Saul Josephus was shipwrecked on Malta. And we pick this story up again in my book, King Jesus. So, Saul Josephus was shipwrecked on Malta in the sort of late autumn of AD 62. And he continued his journey the next spring, the next sailing season, because of course in Rome, the sailing system was really only the summer months uh, when the weather was uh, good enough for making these journeys. And they arrived in Naples in the spring of AD 63. And in Acts of the Apostles, the ship they travelled on was called Castor and Pollux. So ships in those days had names exactly the same as they do now. From Naples, they travelled to Rome. Uh, this is uh, Saul now. This is an account from Acts of the Apostles. And they stopped off for a pint at the um, Three Taverns Inn at uh, Appius. And that's given to us in Acts 28.15. Um, and this tavern was located on the Appian Way, about 50 kilometres from Rome. Note the level of historical accuracy that can be achieved by the Gospels, if it really wants to. And the reasons why so much of it is confusing is deliberate, because they don't really want you to know the historical truth. So the Three Taverns Inn was a staging post, and these staging posts uh, were located all over the Roman Empire, about 25 kilometres, 30 kilometres apart, roughly. And we know this from the Antonine Itinerary, um, which is a slightly later document, but it gives the staging posts all across uh, the Roman Empire. And this is an image of the uh, staging posts across Britain, which someone has put on a modern map of Britain, of course. And it shows that London to Coventry has six uh, staging posts, which makes them about 25 kilometres apart. And at these uh, staging posts, you could change your horses, uh, you could get um, uh, food, of course, and you could even stay the night. We also have this from the travels of Madame Agueria, um, who we will meet in a later lecture. She did a journey from Jerusalem to Edessa in the 4th century. And she said there were 26 staging posts uh, between Jerusalem and Edessa, about 35 kilometers apart. And by all accounts, she was doing one staging post per day. So it took her 26 days to get up to Edessa, which is in northern Syria. So Saul was in the Eternal City for two years, because Acts of the Apostles says so. And Josephus was also in Rome for two years, which is not surprising, really, considering they are the same person. Uh, as far as the accounts of Saul go, he met with the uh, Jewish community in, in Rome, who wanted to know why he had been sent there. And they wanted also to know all about his new Church of Simple Judaism what we call Christianity. But what Saul does not mention uh, in these talks, well, according to Acts of the Apostles anyway, is he doesn't mention the crucifixion story, which is odd. You would have thought that Saul would have been ranting and raving about the evil Romans who had uh, crucified his beloved Jesus. I mean, he was under house, house arrest in Rome, and yet he makes no mention of the full crucifixion story. Likewise, in his, in his epistles, his letters that he sent out uh, on his uh, journeys across the Mediterranean, he makes no real mention of this, this great story, this great foundation stone of Christianity. All we get in the epistles is a few interpolated words about crucifixion. There is no full story of the crucifixion within the epistles. Why not? Why not tell the Jews of Rome about the crucifixion and his dear Jesus who was crucified? The answer is because the crucifixion had not yet happened. It did happen, and we have a complete account of this from the accounts of um, Josephus Flavius, uh, 
But it happened in AD 70, and so it hadn't happened yet. And so in Acts of the Apostles, he's unable to give this story about the crucifixion. So Saul was in Rome for two years, but Josephus was there for two years as well. And because it's Josephus and he is a, a, a very erudite uh, author, we get more information. And this gives us two accounts of the same event. And that's very useful because we can compare these accounts and see where they dovetail and match. So why was Josephus in Rome? Well, this was due to what is known as the Temple Wall Affair. It is a typical example of religious absurdity. King Agrippa, that's Agrippa II, built a new dining room on his palace in Jerusalem, and it gave him nice views over the city and a few views over the temple. But the temple priest didn't like being observed, so the priest built a wall right in front of his window to block his view. I mean... <laughs> Is this going to cause trouble, or what? Well, it did, and eventually the priests were sent uh, to argue their case before Nero. And doubtless Nero was greatly unimpressed having to deal with such trivia from Judea. It doesn't say very much for the administrators and governors of Judea that something of this nature has to be sent to the emperor. Anyway. Josephus says of this, I took a voyage to Rome with certain priests of my acquaintance who were sent to Rome to plead their cause before Nero. I became known to Poppaea, Nero's wife, and took care to ask her to procure the liberty of the priests. So, how did Josephus meet with Poppaea? Well, when he arrived in Rome, he met with Aliturus, who was a Jewish actor and a friend of Poppaea. And he may also have met with uh, Epaphroditus, his publisher. Note that Nero's scribe and publisher was also called Epaphroditus, the same as Josephus's. We're not sure if it's the same individual, but there are many similarities between the two. And because of Poppaea's intervention, Nero allowed the priests to keep their wall. Um, as Josephus says of this, this was granted to them in order to gratify Poppaea, Nero's wife, who was a religious woman and had requested these favours from Nero. A religious woman? Had Josephus converted Poppaea to simple Ju Judaism? Well, <laughs> this is possible. The Jews were famed for being astrologers, like the Old Testament Josephus, uh, sorry, the Old Testament Joseph, who made a, a prophecy for Pharaoh. And also because of the many zodiacs we've seen in and around Galilee, um, the wonderful zodiac at Hamat Tavera. It's clear that those zodiacs were used for prophecy as well as for astro astronomy. And Robert Eisenman says of these events, Robert Eisenman is, is perhaps Judaism's greatest historian, um, modern historian. And Eisenman says, In Rome, Josephus goes directly to Empress Poppaea, who in addition to taking an interest in the Judaic religion, seems to have had a propensity for young men. Well, was Josephus one of these young men? Certainly he was very close to Poppaea. Is this why Poppaea asked Nero for a favour? Well, it's possible, and we might see more evidence of that later. I also speculate here that it's possible that Josephus had been turned, you might call it, that he'd become a spy for Rome. Trouble was brewing in the East, and Nero needed a Romophile Jew who could be the eyes and ears of the emperor in the East. And who better to do that than Saul Josephus. And we know that Josephus did work for the Romans during the Jewish revolt. So bear in mind as we go through these talks that Josephus might have been a spy working for Rome even from this early era. This was like AD 63 onwards. <laughs> 
Anyway, having made their petition to Nero, the priests went home. But Josephus and Saul both stayed on for two years. Because they, they are the same person. And I suppose the next major event in Rome was, was the Great Fire of Rome in AD 64. Now, Saul doesn't mention it in Acts of the Apostles, and Josephus doesn't mention it in his Jewish war, which is very strange because Josephus liked to make a drama out of any trivia. So was the Great Fire of Rome rather smaller than Tacitus makes out? Did he exaggerate that Nero was fiddling while Rome burned? Well, it's quite possible. It's also said that the blame for this fire was put on to simple Judaism, Christianity. But that's unlikely, according to this new chronology. This new chronology says that simple Judaism was, was only seven years old at this time. It was only started in about AD 55, when Saul went across the Mediterranean, evangelizing to the Gentiles. And Saul had not been in Rome before, and there were only a handful of adherents in Rome. So it's unlikely that um, simple Judaism, Christianity, was implicated in the great fire of Rome. Well, not until later anyway. It was probably added at a later date. So the next year, so we're running into AD 65 now, Poppea is said to be pregnant, but it's also said that Nero kicked her in the stomach uh, until she was dead. Now this is a, a striking reaction to a pregnancy, and it might suggest, one might think, that the child was not his. As Robert Eisenman said, Poppea had a propensity for young men, so perhaps it wasn't the child of Nero. But remember, We've just been through this, but remember that Josephus was there at this time, and he was a favourite of Poppea. So what does Josephus say about these tragic events in Rome? Well, we know what he says, because he gives us a full account of this. And he says, And when I had obtained many presents from Poppea, I returned home again. And that's it. No mention of his patron. No lament of her tragic death. He just skips Rome and runs off back to Judea. And again, this is strange for Josephus, because normally he loves to narrate the tittle-tattle of royal courts. So is his silence indicative of involvement? It's possible, we don't know, but it is uh, entirely possible. And why flee back to Judea? Surely the long arm of the Roman law would catch him even there. Well, the answer is that revolution was brewing in Judea, and everybody knew it. And by AD 66, the Jewish revolt had broken out, and Roman law no longer applied in Judea. And so Saul, Josephus, would have been safe in Judea at this point, and his actions in Judea seemed to indicate this may have been his rationale for running off from Rome and going back to Judea in AD 65, just before the Jewish revolt started. I think that's quite enough evidence, really, to show that Saul is Josephus, between this and the previous uh, lecture on this subject. But how does that change the story? Well, in reality, it changes it by a huge amount, because now we have an alternative perspective on the same story. We have two separate accounts of the biblical Jesus within these two books, within the books by Saul and the books by Josephus. As long as we realize that the biblical Jesus was called Jesus of Gamala in the works of Josephus. So remember this name, Jesus of Gamala, because it'll come up time and time again in these talks as we run through the uh, as we run through the accounts of the Jewish revolt.
So these new texts give us new details of this biblical family. As we saw in lecture one with the royal exile from Persia to Syria, a very different perspective on biblical events. And just as a reminder, Josephus said of this, when Herod understood that a Jew from Babylon with 500 horsemen and a hundred of his relations had passed over the Euphrates and now abode in Antioch, Herod sent for this man and promised to give him land in the region of Batania. He also promised to let him hold the country free of taxation. So this is the story about Queen Theomusa Arania and King Phratises being kicked out of Par uh, Persia, Parthia, in AD 4. And so AD 4, well, this must be Herod Archibus, the son of Herod the Great. And this royal family were given lands in the east of Syria and the east of Judea, tax-free. And they set up this new principality called the Kingdom of Arania. So the principality was named after the queen. It was named after Queen Arania. And it's still called that even today. It's called the Haran. But we have many stories about this family from Josephus Flavius. And in other passages, uh, Josephus calls them the Babylonian Jews because they came from Babylon, from Persia or Parthia. And because they eventually they became Jews. Uh, the Talmud says so. So we have this story from the Talmud. And their leader was called Zmaris, uh, or sometimes he's called Judas of Gamala. And he was active in the AD 30s. And Josephus says of Judas, Judas of Gamala became zealous to draw the people to revolt. And he said that this taxation was no better than an introduction to slavery, and exhorted the nation to assert their liberty. So this was a tax dispute because Herod had promised these people to have their lands free of tax, and Rome was reneging on that agreement. And this is a constant theme throughout all of these texts, both uh, the text by Josephus and the biblical text, and throughout my books as well, because they every juncture we see this, this problem of taxation and this tax dispute. And we're probably all familiar with the biblical story of this contentious taxation decree that caused a revolt. Because in this version, the Gospels say, there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed when Quirinus was the governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one to his own city. This was the great taxation by Quirinus in AD 6. So the Herod mentioned here uh, must have been Herod Archelaus again, who ruled from 4 BC to AD 6. Thus the biblical birth, the nativity, must have been in AD 6, two years after the Babylonian Jews arrived in, in Syria. It's unlikely that the biblical nativity occurred in 6 BC, as is often said, under Herod the Great. It's much more likely that it happened in AD 6 under his son, called um, Herod Archimus. Anyway, the leader of the Babylonian Jews in the AD 30s was called Judas of Gamala. So what was his role and his politics and his religion in this era? Well, Saul says of him, Judas of Gamala was the author of the Galilean sect of Jewish philosophy, and they have an inviolable attachment to liberty and do not value dying any kind of death. And it was in Floris's time that the nation began to grow with this distemper. And this is interesting because, well, it tells us that Judas was the leader this is Judas of Gamala, was the leader of the Galilean sect, the Nazarenes. But remember, Jesus was called a Nazarene, and he was called a Galilean in Matthew 2.23 and Luke 23.6. And Jesus was also a revolutionary, just like Judas. 
So this is this is this huge link here between the leader of the Babylonian Jews and the gospel Jesus and James, because they were both leaders of the same religious sect, the Galilean Nazarenes. And this is why it's interesting, because we get this alternative story from Josephus Flavius about what these Nazarene Galileans were doing. But do note that Galilean here doesn't refer to the Sea of Galilee. It refers to a Jewish sect, the religion of the Galileans, as the, the Gospels themselves make perfectly clear. Josephus says a lot about these Galileans, about the Church of Jesus and James. Uh, and so you can see how useful this second source is, this second perspective on gospel events. Anyway, Josephus says uh, of these Galileans, all sorts of misfortunes sprang from these men, and the nation was infected with this doctrine to an incredible degree. One violent war came upon us after another, and the very temple of God was burned down. Okay, so the temple was burned down by the Galileans. So this must refer to the Jewish revolt of AD 66 to 70. So if, if the Galileans um, from the stories of Josephus are the same as the Galileans from the Gospel story, then Jesus was probably involved in the Jewish revolt. And again, we'll see this time and time again as we look through these gospel stories. But if your knowledge of the gospel stories only came from the priesthood, from Sunday school, um, you would say this is very unlikely, you know, because Jesus is just a prophet of peace. He's not a, he's not a revolutionary. And yet the gospels do say that Jesus was a revolutionary. The Gospel of Mark says, and there was one named Barabbas who lay bound with them who had made revolution with Jesus and who had committed murder in the revolution. Which revolt was Jesus involved in? As we've seen before, the AD 30s were relatively quiet. So what revolt could Jesus have been involved in? Well, now with this alternate perspective from Josephus Flavius, we now have a more accurate timeline, a believable timeline, because Josephus mentions the governorship of Florus, and he was the governor of Judea from AD 64 to 66. And then he also mentions the temple being burned down, and we know when that happened. That was in AD 66 to 70 during the Jewish revolt. We're beginning to glimpse a view of the real Jesus here. Josephus recounts the history of two revolutionaries. There was Judas of Gamala, who was active in the AD 30s, and Jesus of Gamala, who was active in the AD 60s. And I say they were father and son. And I also say, obviously, that Jesus of Gamala was the biblical Jesus, and we'll see lots and lots of evidence for that in later lectures. But let's have a quick look at the first of these revolutionaries, because back in the AD 30s, Judas of Gamala was the leader of the fourth sect of Galileans, much as we've seen previously. And an interesting thing here is that his second in command was a guy called Zadok. Now, Zadok means justice or righteous, um, but this is a very familiar title from, from the Gospels. Because, well, first of all, the Essenes, the ascetic monks who lived on the shores of the Dead Sea, the Essenes were called the sons of Zadok. And so we see this strong link here between um, the Babylonian Jews who came out of Persia and the Essene sect. In fact, I go on in the books to say that the Essenes were probably a splinter group that broke off from the fourth sect Galileans. 
and set up their sort of ascetic monastery down on the shores of the Sea of um, down on the shores of the Dead Sea at Qumran. So the, the leader of the fourth sect, uh, sorry, the second in command of the fourth sect was called Zadok. And similarly, James, the brother of Jesus, was called James Justus, which means Zadok. And Jesus was called the Just One in Acts 7.52, which means Zadok. Thus two of the primary characters in the New Testament were called Jesus the Zadok and James the Zadok. And so the biblical leaders, Jesus and James, had the same names and titles as the leaders of the Babylonian Jews. Again, we see all these links between these two stories, which is why I'm joining together the gospel stories with the stories by Josephus Flavius, because they are one and the same history, if you really know what they're talking about. There are also links and similarities here between the Church of Jesus and the Essene, the Essene from Qumran, who we've just mentioned, and between the Essene and the Knights Templar, who do get a mention in these books on occasions. I don't do a lot on the Knights Templar, but they, they do get the odd mention because they are important in this story. And one interesting thing is that all of these sects live from the communal purse. They were communists, which is quite traditional within uh, Judaism, uh, just like the kibbutz farms, which, uh, well, sort of still exist in, in Israel today. They were quite popular in the, uh, from, the say, the 50s up to the 90s. They were very popular, and many people joined the um, kibbutz farms. But as their wealth has increased, they've become less popular, and they, most of these kibbutzes have turned into uh, farming collectives instead, so they're not really fully co communist anymore. Anyway, communism is, is traditional in Judaism and within the Church of Jesus and James, and also within the monastic system in Europe, of course. Monks had no possession. Uh, monks had no possessions. They were a communist community. But the monastery itself could be very rich, as we saw during the um, era of Henry VIII, during the dissolution of the monasteries, and that great wealth went to the royal court of Henry VIII. So let's have a quick look at these biblical communist communities who lived out of the common purse. Well, the first one is a, a fairly obvious one, I suppose. The first one is the Essenes. Again, those ascetic monks in Qumran on the shores of the Dead Sea, who were clothed in white robes and carried nothing but their swords. And the Dead Sea Scrolls say of the Essenes, one of the principal characteristics of the Essene was a common ownership of property. New members handed over their belongings to the superiors, and the Essenes received all they needed from the common purse. Well, in a similar fashion, the Knights Templar did very much the same. They were ascetic monks who wore white, white robes and travelled uh, through Europe with nothing but a sword. And a history of the Templars say, all money from tithes and properties belonged to the order as a whole. Everything was held communally without any wealth in the hands of the individual. And then we can come down to the Church of Jesus and James, who were exactly the same, yet another communist-style religious sect. So of the Church of Jesus and James, well, they were ascetic monks once, once more, who wore white robes, and travelled with swords. And the Gospels say of the disciples, none of the followers claimed that his things were his own. They held everything in common, for those who possessed lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds to the feet of the apostles. 
which might be why all of these sects were called the poor. The Essenes, the fourth sects, the Nazarenes, the Ebionites, they were all called the poor. And of course, the Knights Templar were called the poor Knights of Christ, so they were exactly the same. And presumably, this is because these ascetic monks gave up their wealth to the church. But as we said before, the actual community itself could be inordinately rich, as we know from the history of the Knights Templar. But if you did not give everything you owned to the church, the punishment could be quite severe. And the Gospels say of this, Ananias sold a property and kept back part of the price. St. Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to keep back a part of the price? And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and died. And after three hours, his wife also fell down at St. Peter's feet and died. What a tragic tale. And here it is, the death of Ananias by Raphael. <sighs> Interesting, isn't it? What this means is, if you did not give all your property to the church of Jesus and James, St. Peter would kill you. Yeah, This is something that the Pope doesn't preach from uh, one of his sermons uh, from the window of the Vatican, does he? But this is the real Gospels. If you go into the nitty-gritty of, of, of the Gospels, this is what it says. Biblical history can be very different from what is normally taught. And so what we're doing here is we're peeling away the Gospel icing sugar to re reveal the historical truth that lies underneath it. This was all first-century power politics of royal dynasties because Jesus was the king of the Jews. And we can carry on and find yet more similarities, this time between the Knights Templar and the Church of Jesus, because both of them employed warrior monks. It is said of the um, Church of Jesus and James that the Galileans do not value dying any kind of death nor can any such fear make them call any man Lord. And in a similar fashion, it is said of the Knights Templar, the Templars were inordinately courageous, but their policy regarding their battle standards no doubt contributed to their fearless reputation in battle. Yes, in reality, in gospel reality, not the sugar-coated version, but in reality, many of the disciples were also fearless warriors. Simon Zelotes, for instance, was a zealot, and the zealots were the fanatical rebels who opposed the Roman occupation of Judea. And so one of the disciples of Jesus was a zealot. Meanwhile, Judas Iscariot was a Scari, again a fanatical daggerman who mingled with the festival crowds in order to kill their enemies. And one of the disciples of Jesus was a Sicari daggerman. You see how this story is rather different to what is normally told. And, and Christians will often say, no, no, you're misinterpreting this. You know, Jesus was a man of peace. But Jesus, in the Gospels, Jesus himself said, Do not think I have come to bring peace on earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father and the daughter against her mother. And a man's enemies shall be of his own household. Well, Adam Clark, the venerable theologian, he's a 19th century the theologian, very well worth reading, actually. His commentary on the Bible is very, very interesting and very, very detailed. But anyway, Adam Clark says of this, this is a difficult passage. 
Well, yes, it's, it's, it's very difficult because it's actually describing a civil war. It's describing the Jewish revolt of AD 66 to 70. So many of the gospel verses are not exactly as we have been taught. And here is another interesting passage that highlights the, highlights the true nature of, of, of the Gospels, the sort of monarchical and royal nature of the Gospels. This is the parable of the rich man. Again, you probably won't have heard this if you've just been to Sunday school and uh, just had religion taught in school and maybe been to the church on a few occasions. You will not have heard this. I, I, I very much doubt anyway. Anyway, this is the parable of the rich man. So this is a story about a master who gave his money to his servants before he went away. Now, some of the servants invested that money, but one of them did not. And on their master's return, the master was enraged that one of his servants had not received any interest on the money he had given him. So the rich man says, take the money from him and give it to the one who has lots of money. For unto everyone that has shall be given, and he shall have in abundance. But from him that has nothing, even that which he has will be taken away. And as Adam Clark says, this is another of these difficult passages. Well, yes, indeed. Here, Jesus is giving open support for banking, the charging of interest. And he's giving support for absent, absentee landlords and for punishing errant servants. Time and time again in these Gospels, we see Jesus as the champion of the aristocracy. And the, um, the other parable, the, um, the parable of the vineyard owner, is very much the same. And we might go through that um, those verses in a later lecture. We'll see if there's time. Okay, finally, we're coming to the end of this uh, lecture, but here is, here is another of these difficult passages, as Adam Clark so rightly calls them. And this one is interesting because it's more pertinent to this research. This is the strange uh, parable of the contentious marriage. And I've paraphrased this because the original is quite long, but anyway, the meaning is, is the same. And the parable goes, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who made a marriage for his son and sent out invitations to the aristocracy to come to the wedding, but they would not come and made light of it. When the king heard of this, he was angry, and he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, go to the highways and invite anyone to the marriage. So the servants gathered together as many as they could, both good and bad, and the wedding was furnished with guests. Interesting, isn't it? And here it is, this is the, um, this is the disputed marriage by Brunswick. So why is, interest, why is Jesus so interested in the trials and tribulations of royalty? Well, there's always an excuse, isn't there? Devout Christians will probably say, this is a parable, it's a parable. You need to look at the secondary meanings. And in this case, the secondary meanings are, uh, the king being mentioned here is probably God sending out invitations to the Nazarene church, the church of Jesus and James. And many rich and powerful people are deaf to this invitation and they don't come. But many poor people hear it and they do go. Sometimes this is interpreted as being Jews and Gentiles, not rich and poor, but you get the same idea how the, uh, how the parable works. But... Parables work on two levels, the overt and the covert, the obvious and the hidden. The reader must be familiar with the overt meaning in order to make sense of the story. 
So who was this king, the real king, in real history? Which aristocracy refused to go to a royal wedding? Do we have this in history? Is there such an event? Well, yes, there is. And we should all know about this disputed marriage because we talked about it. Um, just testing you. We talked about it in lecture number one on Cleopatra to Christ. This was the marriage between Queen Theomusa Aurania of Persia, or Parthia, to her son, Prince Phratasis. And as we saw in that lecture, this marriage was so deeply unpopular in Parthia that these two monarchs were thrown out of the country. And they ended up in a stable in Syria, being visited by the Persian Magi. In which case, Jesus was interested in this contentious marriage because it was the marriage of his father and his stepmother. And that is why it was added to the Gospel stories. So as you see, the real Gospel stories are so much more interesting than the sugar-coated ones. So in summary, we've seen abundant evidence now that Saul was Joseph Flavius. And we have seen how this exposes new accounts and new perspectives on gospel events, how, how Jesus was Jesus of Gamala. And we'll see more of that in later lectures. And we've also seen links between the Church of Jesus and other sects like the Essene and uh, the Knights Templar. And we've also seen how the gospel story is linked to historical events of the Jewish revolt. This was not a story of carpenters, fishermen and tent makers. This was a story of international power politics in first century Rome. And we are going to see much more of this in later lectures. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this lecture and its new radical perspective on gospel history. And I hope you can join us again next time for these Illumination Lectures. Thank you.